Well, the reason that it is not painful to me to be have dedicated a career to this endeavor are a couple of fold. First of all, the women that I have worked with who are abused bring incredible strength, incredible resistance to the enterprise, and it has been my honor to be able to know many of them very well. I also have wonderful colleagues in this field, and one of them is here that I have known for at least 30 years, something like that. Um, and the people who work in gender-based violence tend to be really terrific people, and they're great to hang out with, to have as friends as well as colleagues and coworkers. So, am I pointing it wrong? You promised me. <laughs> they promised me. We should have tested it. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I can do it that way. All right. So, gender based violence. There are many different viewpoints that people bring to this enterprise. Um, and your ethical questions in this work depend in part on your point of view. So there are many people that say this is an issue of women's rights. This is a feminist issue. Working now, you think? You think? Maybe? <laughs> oh, that's right. That has to go into something. Okay. It's the, the, the thing we didn't do. Um, or is it an issue of human rights and without the gender piece? Um, is it an issue of social justice? And there are many people that would take that kind of framework. Is it from a social science, sociology, family violence kind of viewpoint that you want to look at this issue? Is it psychology, a trauma framework? Pathology is usually part of the psychological looking. What are the pathological, the mental illnesses that either cause violence or are a result of that? But also, uh, mental health is also oftentimes interested in things like the alcohol connection. Is it a women's health issue? Um, violence against women is often the terminology that people use from a women's health issue. Is it a public health issue? It's a public health problem, after all. It affects the public. Um, is that the perspective we should take? Should we be looking at it in terms of health inequities, health disparities between groups? because violence oftentimes is disproportionately affecting people who are less powerful, more vulnerable, more poor. Is it a nursing science issue where we look at the holistic human being and we also bring to bear looking at people's strengths? Is it a medical problem? Are there diseases that go along with violence against women, gender-based violence that need to be treated? Is it a social work issue? And social work brings the wonderful perspective of looking at the family as well as the individual person. Advocacy organizations, is it those wonderful groups that have worked on this issue um, for as long as I have and before, who also recognize very much the strengths of abused women, the resistance. And I have learned incredible amounts from the domestic violence advocacy world. Is it a criminal justice problem? Is that what we should be looking at? Is it a crime? I would say that all of these perspectives have helped inform our science, our knowledge on this issue, but I believe no matter what perspective we use, that gender matters. So when we look at the world mur murder rates per 100,000, this is the way WHO counts murders. They count murders of anybody, women and men, uh, they break it down, how many women are murdered versus how many men, and that's all they do in terms of gender. Um, after that, they look at the basic causes, the demographics, and the picture of murder, because men are so much more likely to murder men than to have women involved in that enterprise, that the risk factors they come up with, the characteristics of murder, is all about male murder. So they will say, Murders are most likely to be between acquaintances. They're most likely to come out of poverty neighborhoods. There's gangs involved. All of those characteristics that WHO talks about in terms of murder around the world has to do with men murdering other men. And we, when we look at gender-based violence, when we look at it in a gender framework, 
And I did this with a group, and it was published last summer in The Lancet. Um, and we looked at what we knew about gender-based homicide when women are killed by a partner, because when women are killed around the world, they are most often killed by a husband, boyfriend, ex-husband, ex-boyfriend. That's true globally. And so the math is somewhat different when we look at women killed by partners. And look at the pale area is where we have no data, where people have not counted the bodies of women to look at what relationship they have with the murderer. So they have only counted the bodies and just called them women and put them in the annals that way, and they have never looked at the relationship between perpetrator and victim, and therefore they have never looked at what those risk factors and dynamics might be that are different from when men kill men. Um, and this down here is what we know about in terms of, I will, thank you. Um, the, down here is what we know about um, when women kill male partners. The map is, is different. It very seldom happens. Um, and we also have great swaths of the world where we know nothing about that. So when gender gets into it, the globe pays very little attention in terms of murders. And what we think we know globally about murders has all to do with men murdering men. One of the great resources that we have now are these um, world maps that have been looked at in terms of gender. And we see this map in terms of trafficking in females. First of all, notice we actually have more information when we look at laws about trafficking. And that's how this analysis was done. So we see that um, the dark here is trafficking is not Ill illegal and is commonly practiced. So we have parts of the world. If you went back to the homicide, we'd notice that those parts of the world also we know nothing about intimate partner murders. So in some ways, these things track on the same. And in terms of, of we, again, we have no data, but in fewer of the world, it's easier to find out what laws there are. This is women's physical security. Now, this involves homicide where we have counted, but it also involves gender-based violence in general. So we have more information. And the physical security that um, down here is where women lack physical security, where there's high rates of gender-based violence of various forms, sexual assault, uh, domestic violence, um, and you notice it's mostly in this triangle, but we also have some pockets in other parts of the world. And one of the things that this analysis looks at is that f women's physical security, which is, as I mentioned, domestic violence, rape, marital rape, and femicide, is significantly associated with a global peace index. So where there is less women's physical security, there is more warfare. It's also linked with economic development. So gender-based violence is an issue of economic development globally. Um, and this was published in 2009, but some very fascinating data when we look at the global pictures. So here in the United States, we are having great arguments about whether or not gender matters in domestic violence issues. Um, the, the CDC definition um, is gender neutral between persons who are spouses or non-marital partners, dating boyfriend, girlfriend, or former spouses, um, and talking about physical and or sexual violence or threat of such violence or psychological, emotional abuse and or coercive tactics where that has been prior physical and or sexual violence. So you notice in this definition that there has to have been prior physical violence or threat of physical violence, which is very much a criminal justice kind of perspective on that, so that if there's actual violence or threat of violence, then it is a crime. 
if there's actual physical assault or threat of physical assault, there is a crime. While emotional abuse, psychological emotional abuse, and or coercive tactics by themselves is not a crime. So you can see how even in a public health definition, CDC, the perspectives of the other perspectives get into there. Um, and, but there are many people who would say emotional abuse controlling behavior is a form of violence if it occurs even by itself. Um, and that is a perspective that the, the uh, women's rights perspective, the advocacy perspective will oftentimes hold. Then there's the issues, the arguments around gender symmetry. And there are several researchers who have done meta-analysis, et cetera, and so forth of data on, on intimate partner violence who say it's absolutely equal between men and women. And there's various theoretical approaches that people use to address that. One of them is Michael Johnson's topology, and this comes out of a sociology kind of a framework, but it also has um, its footprints uh, from the advocacy kinds of uh, women's rights uh, frameworks. Because you notice that he first called the first type of intimate partner violence patriarchal terrorism. So you can see that, that feminist perspective, the women's rights kind of perspective coming through there because a form of uh, the, this form of violence came, came from the patriarchy kinds of notions. Now he calls it intimate terrorism. He's gotten a little bit more um, gender neutral as we've gone along. So he calls it intimate terrorism. But he certifies that in this form of intimate partner violence, the male patterns of coercive control are very strong. You can see them. There's gender asymmetry. This intimate terrorism, there's more men terrorizing women than there are women terrorizing men. Um, there's less difference across socioeconomic class, so there's less associations with poverty with this form of intimate partner violence. We see increasing severity and frequency. So this is the type of domestic violence that many of us are familiar with. Um, the increasing severity and frequency, these are oftentimes the women that we see, and I'll say we because I work with many shelters closely, see in domestic violence shelters. Then he contrasts this with situational couple violence, where it's much more mutual violence, where there's much more gender symmetry, where in couples where, who they um, resolve their disagreements by physically fighting with each other. And so there's much more gender symmetry there. There's other, much more influence of other violence risk factors like social inequities, um, health inequities kind of a framework. Now there's some questions here. Is this situational couple violence a precursor of intimate terrorism? Can it go from this mutual kind of fighting to a more intimate terrorism? And oftentimes I have talked to many, many, many abused women who say, you know, I tried fighting back, and I tried hitting back, and I just got hit worse, just got hurt worse, so I stopped doing that. So they would look more like they were in this intimate terrorism when they may have started out looking more like situational couple violence. And when we do general um, sociological surveys, even when we do health surveys, we're gonna, of course, get much more of this because guess who might not ever agree to be in such a survey, might not ever be able to even answer the phone to agree to such a survey. So we're gonna see more of these kinds of people in our population-based public health kinds of surveys. One of the things we found, and we did some testing on this, that it wasn't nice and neat and tidy. There's either intimate terrorism or there's situational couple violence. Um, there's a little bit more gradation in between and that the controlling behavior, which really characterizes this intimate terrorism, um, is less likely to, uh, to sort out to either you use it or you don't. There's different gradations in between. So it's probably less neat and tidy than, than uh, we would have liked to have thought. And Michael Johnson is saying the same thing. There's some other groups, um, things like violent resistors, mutually controlling couples, um, although there's smaller numbers in those when he's tested it. So that's an interesting framework to think about. Another framework people are thinking about, which originated in psychology, 
is this trauma kind of framework. For both men and women, when you grow up in a home where adults hit each other or hit children in order to deal with conflict or for other um, traumatic experiences in their own lives, um, this is one of the biggest risk factors for adult intimate partner violence. And we, when children see father hit mother, um, or even if there's mutual violence in the home, we see symptoms of trauma in those kids. And we see um, that their brains, as well as their development, are affected by this trauma. Um, this helps to explain our intergenerational transmission, where we see uh, what some people call the cycle of violence, where families whole families, um, generation after generation, see, uh, use a lot of violence. And it used to be assumed that this was all learning, that when you saw your father beat your mother, you learned to use hitting as a way to resolve conflict. And in part, that's probably it, the modeling kinds of things. But the trauma framework has helped us understand more what all is happening to this whole human being that their psychology is also affected, their brain development is affected. And uh, Judy Atkinson, who is a wonderful Aboriginal scholar from Australia, talks about trauma trails. And she talks about it in terms of like our trails of tears that our indigenous people were made to follow, that kind of historical trauma is part of it that keeps getting perpetuated against our indigenous people both here and in Australia. But there's also trauma trails through the body. And we in nursing say it's not just in the brain that we're seeing changes. That brain affects our whole body. So we see those changes physiologically. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. Uh, we also find from a trauma framework the substance abuse connection. And we've known for a long time that many abusers are also substance abusers. We've always said that it doesn't cause anybody to hit anybody when you get drunk. We know there's way too many drunk people on college campuses and, you know, relatively little violence, actually. You know, people don't hit each other just because they're drunk. However, we do find that traumatized individuals oftentimes do use substances in order to tamp down all those PTSD symptoms those trauma symptoms, those anxiety symptoms, that this is a way we self-medicate. We see that in our, our soldiers coming back from war who have been traumatized. We see that in children who grow up in those families. We see them using substances. And the alcohol is, certainly adds fuel to the fire. It doesn't help us think very well. If we're hypervigilant from PTSD, we're ready to fight for the next person that comes along. We're ready to see a threat anywhere, including from our partners. And then if we put some alcohol on top of that, we're even less likely to be able to sort it out cognitively. So it certainly adds fuel to the fire. And it certainly is both a precursor risk factor for intimate partner violence and other forms of violence. It's also a sequelae but it's not causative. Uh, but part of that we have yet to uh, figure out um, in terms of all of how that might work, but it's definitely part of the picture. Now the other thing is I mentioned those trauma experiences as children. Um, the ACEs study is a very famous study that was done by CDC. You can go to their website and you can look at all of the research that came out of it. But basically, the notion is, and this was done at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, so it's primarily a middle class, primarily white, fairly well-off sample of 17,000 people. So it's not a trivial kind of a sample. And what they looked at is these adverse childhood experiences. It was actually first started when the physician who, um, Vince Folletti, who is the PI of, of all of this study, noticed that he had a group of overweight, obese women that kept trying to lose weight, and they were not able to. 
and they were well-meaning, smart, intelligent people that were just having a really hard time with obesity. And he said, what is it? What is it in their childhood that might set them apart? So he started asking them and asked about, was there child abuse? This is one of the adverse childhood experiences. Child abuse and neglect in your childhood. Growing up, seeing your father beat your mother or your mother beat your father. Growing up with domestic violence. Substance abuse was one of your parents, a significant substance abuser. Mental illness in one of the parents. Parental discord, which is you know sort of like growing up with domestic violence and or crime. Um, that one of your uh, parents was incarcerated or involved in crime. And they counted the more adverse childhood events, they saw more social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, more adoption of health risk be behaviors like smoking, like drinking, more mental and physical illness, more disability and social problems, and earlier death. The more ACEs you have, the more likely you're to die early from cardiovascular disease, as well as suicide and HIV, but from cardiovascular disease, which we don't ordinarily think of being linked to childhood experiences of trauma. So a very important and eye-opening study. And part of it was that they found in this very well-off, affluent population, well-educated, that 16% of them had four or more ACEs. Only a third had none. And so it was a fairly robust prevalence of ACEs in this sample. They also found that the more childhood abuse there was, the more they often that they were witnessing domestic violence also. Uh, one of our researchers in this field, um, Jeff Edelson, calls this the double whammy. So not only are you traumatized by being abused yourself, but you're also witnessing your father beats your mother, which is also part of this intergenerational transmission. So this nice stair-step kind of, of response where we see the more um, uh, childhood abuse, the more frequency of witnessing domestic violence. And the ACEs tend to come in groups. If you had a battered woman, you have a 95% had at least one additional ACE, 82% two, 64, 48, and more than half of the people that had a battered mother had equal to or more than five ACEs. So clearly an association with this domestic violence. And especially for women, when they have high scores of ACEs, they are much more likely to be the victim of domestic violence when they grow up. Much, and this is victimization. Unfortunately, they didn't ask whether or not you perpetrate domestic violence. So we don't know about perpetration. And probably the, that association with perpetration is very strong, especially for men. But men also are more likely to be victimized, but less, much less likely to be victimized. So we have this association with the ACEs and growing up to be abused um, in your own adult relationships. We can talk about why that might be. But as I mentioned, the trauma trails, trauma makes a, draws a path through the body and affects our mental and physical health and behavior. And healing from trauma, therefore, needs to be an important part of the solutions to violence. You know, what we tend to do is either teach people you should not be violent, do not hit. That's more or less what the dating violence prevention programs in schools do. It's a very cognitive approach can be very useful for some people if they are not highly traumatized. That's what we do when we, uh, in um, many of our um, uh, partner violence intervention programs are very much on a cognitive basis. You really shouldn't do that. Uh, let me you know, teach you how hard it is on your victim um, to be violent toward them. What we don't do is work on the trauma that those abusers have undoubtedly experienced. Uh, one of the things, I don't know if you heard of the Chicago um, work that they're doing using former gang mes uh, members to be interrupters and to go in the community and help other gang members not be violent, talk to them about not using violence, give them alternative behaviors to use, et cetera. Somewhat successful, the only trouble is those former gang members, one of them, one of the leaders, 
was arrested for domestic violence, which was his third criminal offense for domestic violence. So you know it was pretty bad. So although they were teaching him to be a good interrupter from his fellow gang members and making sure that they didn't shoot each other, in his own life, at home, because probably his trauma had never been addressed, he was violent toward his, his girlfriend, extremely violent toward his girlfriend. Um, so this is part of, has to be part of the solutions, is that healing. So this is some data from here in the United States, one of those uh, population-based polling that we talk about in terms of our prevalence here. And one of the things to look at is in terms of physical violence, and this is female saying, sometime in my lifetime, I've experienced physical violence from a husband, boyfriend, ex-husband, ex-boyfriend, or same-sex partner, or ex-same-sex partner. And we see that 33% of women in this country say, yes, that has happened to me. Males in the lifetime is almost as much. 28.2% say, sometime in my lifetime, a partner or ex-partner has hit me. Um, now, we don't know about same-sex um, relationships with those numbers, but past year, we have only 4% of women say, this has happened to me, I've been physically hit in the past year. Males in the past year, more of them say it's happened to them. Uh, rape is definitely gendered, and this is intimate partner rape. So almost 10% of women say, sometime in my lifetime, my partner or ex-partner has physically forced me to have sex. This is rape. This is not pressured sex. This is rape. So this is definitely a gender matters here. Stalking, also we see much more stalking. So if we combine rape, physical violence, and or stalking, we do have a gender difference. And here is where we see the real gender difference, is in terms of the IPV-related impact, fear, PTSD symptoms, injury, unwanted pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, missed work, need for services. Almost 30% of women say because of gender-based violence, I've had this kind of impact on my life, and 10% of men. So it does happen for men with impact, but there is a gender difference there. Severe physical violence, we also see a gender difference. And psychological aggression, though coercive control, which was very carefully measured, very interesting to many of this, almost 50% of men say that I have been coerced, controlled, psychologically abused by a partner or ex-partner, and even more in the past year than do women. So if we hang our gender hat, you know, if we hang our whole hat around gender in terms of the coercive control and psychological aggression, as many men think that happens to them. Uh, we also, we did some dating violence uh, work in Baltimore City and found the same kind of thing, that young men think they're, um, terribly psychologically abused by female partners. But when we get to injury, there we see that gender difference. Um, so there are gender differences, but we have to sort them out carefully, and we also have to remember who didn't take part in this survey. And many, I would say, of the victims of intimate terrorism never answered the phone. Uh, when we look at homicide, domestic violence homicide um, in this country, one of the good news stories, it has gone down. One of the ironic things, it has gone down far more for men being killed by their partners than it has for women. What used to be a one-to-one -one ratio back in 1976, a long time ago, is now a four-to-one or five-to-one ratio. And back then, they didn't even count the ex-boyfriends and ex-girlfriends. They weren't even counted in those surveys, um, in those counting of dead bodies. But at least we do keep a fairly careful tally in the United States of domestic violence homicides. And it has gone down, but far more for, for men being killed by intimate partners than for women. And what we have noticed with this decrease, it has gone along with the increase in domestic violence services, the domestic violence laws in this country. And that's what's made a big difference because when women are killed by a partner, 
um, in this country, at least 50% of them um, are killed by a husband, boyfriend, or ex. That's nine times that we're killed by a stranger. And I bet you if we went up in the museum and asked any random woman who she ought to be the most frightened of, who might murder her, she would say the stranger in the night. That's what we, you know, lock our doors against. That's what we be careful when we get into a car. And yet nine times the rate of women killed by strangers, they are killed by an intimate partner or ex. It's the seventh leading cause of premature death in this country. We lead the world except for Russia and South Africa in terms of homicide of women being a leading cause of death. It's the number two cause of death for young African American women. And the number three cause of death, and this is not premature, this is just overall, for young American Indian, Native Alaskan women. Immigrant women are at increased risk, especially in New York City. So not only does gender matter, also culture matters, um, context matters. We also find that when women are killed, the most frequent precursor is prior domestic violence against that woman. And women are more at risk when they're in the process of leaving or have left the abusive relationship. So that's when, um, and gender really matters there. Um, and we also find that women are far more likely to be the victims of homicide suicides. That in about a third of the cases where a male partner kills his partner, he kills himself afterwards. When women kill themselves, um, I mean, I'm sorry, if women kill their partners, they hardly ever kill themselves afterwards. Um, so that decrease in domestic violence homicides against men is in part explained by this one. When a male partner is killed, there's been prior wife abuse, abuse of the female partner before she killed him in 75% of the cases. So these abused women that used to, in 1976, feel like the only way out was to kill him, now know that in most parts of this country, there's a fairly good criminal justice response, and there's such a thing as a shelter or advocacy services for women. And so they're less likely to kill their partners. There's also data from WHO, from the multi-country study, um, some of the health outcomes that we see here um, globally are particularly suicidal thoughts and suicide. In fact, now, at least globally, prior domestic violence is the number one risk factor for women killing themselves. In this country, it's also a very strong risk factor, but there's only been one good study done of that in terms of what were the precursors of suicide for women. And that was done only on African-American women. So we know it's the main risk factor for African-American women killing themselves. We don't know for sure about the rest of women, but we know from globally that it's a very strong risk factor. And th these are adjusted odds ratios. Induced abortion is very common. And women saying that because of domestic violence all over the world, all different parts of the world, that they have poor or very poor health. We also find it associated with infant mortality. So their, their babies are also dying more. And part of that is around some of the complications of pregnancy that are related to domestic violence. We also find for maternal mortality, domestic violence is very much associated. In fact, in our proud state of Maryland, a very fairly affluent um, uh, state in this country, we find that Homicide is the leading cause of maternal mortality. We find that when women are killed, and maternal mortality is when women die during pregnancy or in the six months to a year after a baby is born or after there's an abortion or a miscarriage. So that's maternal mortality. Um, and um, one of the things we found was that in Maryland, when we looked at this very carefully, that the primary homicidal par um, perpetrator was partners or ex-partners, just like it is when women are not pregnant or immediately postpartum. Now, it was interesting. Every state in this country, including Pennsylvania, um, has a maternal mortality review board. And it's usually um, 
obstetrics and gynecologists, mostly obstetricians, who um, staff these maternal mortality boards. They're done at the state level, and they look into every case where a woman dies during pregnancy or in the um, six months later. And they try and ascertain what perhaps the healthcare system could have done differently. Now, in most states, including Maryland, they do not look at the cases of homicide because they say, well, that's a criminal justice issue, homicides during pregnancy. That doesn't have anything to do with health. In fact, that's what one of the leaders of our Maryland Maternal Mortality Board said to me when we presented this data to them, because we were telling them they ought to be looking at those cases of homicide also. He said, well, that doesn't, homicide, that doesn't, that doesn't really have anything to do with health. And I'm like, well, didn't somebody die here? You know, <laughs> I think that's health in a big way. Um, I didn't exactly say it like that. And he said, oh, oh, I didn't mean to, you know, I didn't mean that. I just meant there's nothing that the healthcare system can do about it. But those women that were killed in Maryland, we were able to look at their healthcare records for in most of their cases. And almost all of them had been in the healthcare system for prenatal care or for something to do with when the pregnancy ended. So they were in the healthcare system, and yes, the healthcare system can do something about that. We could find them, we could work with them, we could do something. So even, you know, trying to make the case from a medical point of view, I think we were able to persuade them, and then they were like, but oh, there'll be so many more cases to review. <laughs> you know, we're not sure we can take that on, but they're thinking about it. Um, so that's one of the things that we're trying to do is get the state maternal mortality review boards to look at those cases of homicide, not just look at the cases that are from other um, um, causes of death. And part of why it's the leading cause of uh, maternal mortality in Maryland is because now some of those other causes of maternal mortality have gone down. In most other countries around the world, the proportion of maternal mortality due to intimate partner femicide is unknown. They have not even looked at that. And yet, maternal mortality is one of the millennium goals, one of the things that the global um, community is very concerned about, and so it should be. Uh, but we would say, well, maybe it's not the only thing you should be looking at, but you should also be looking at the intimate partner homicides. There's only one small study in India that looked at homicide as a cause of maternal mortality, which suggested that there was a significant proportion of it related to domestic violence um, homicides. So the fatal health outcomes, as I mentioned, um, one of the pieces I did not say before was that 45 to 47 percent, and this is from our national femicide study, of the women that were killed were seen in the healthcare system before the homicide in the year before the homicide. Some of them in emergency departments, some of them in uh, prenatal care, some of them in primary care, in various parts of the healthcare system, and we clearly failed. And that's where you would get into the, an ethical responsibility, I would think. Uh, we clearly failed to adequately address that in the healthcare system. Unfortunately, in that data, only 4% of those women were seen in the advocacy organizations, were seen in shelters before they were killed. Um, and I mentioned that homicide is a leading cause of maternal mortality. In terms of health outcomes, one of the things that we always need to remember is that a good proportion, 20% in our study, of women who were abused by partners were experiencing physical assault and physically forced sex, intimate partner rape, and emotional abuse. So they were getting all three forms of traumatic experiences from a partner. A lot of overlap between physical and emotional. Some women emotionally abused or controlled by itself, a few women physically assaulted by itself, and a very small slice forced into sex without other forms of violence. But when we see those kinds of health outcomes, and as I mentioned, the more ACEs, the more likely women are to be in an abusive relationship, so we have multiple trauma responses, and we have many different physical health outcomes, reproductive health, 
Um, babies that are small for gestational age, that are low birth weight, we have more HIV. We have more postpartum depression in women who are abused during pregnancy. We have the gynecological problems, health problems. We have chronic disease problems. Um, and this it causes lifetime issues oftentimes with things like diabetes, more obesity. Um, as I mentioned, more homicide, uh, more maternal mortality, but also more disability, more of these chronic health problems. We see more risk factors, more smoking, and that does increase the risk of the cardiovascular disease for sure, but that's not the only part of it. Uh, we see tremendous sleep problems. In fact, when women come to the healthcare system, they most often come saying, I can't sleep. Just give me something so I can sleep. And I would maintain if we don't ask further in terms of what's going on in terms of their sleeping problems, is it a symptom of PTSD? Is it because they are sleeping next to their abuser and afraid to go to sleep at night? Um, is it that the abusive uh, person is triggering their PTSD symptoms that are left over from childhood? No wonder they can't sleep. We wouldn't be able to sleep either. Uh, but yet if we only give them sleeping medication and not find out whether or not there's domestic violence, we are inadequately treating those people. We have more mental health problems, stress, PTSD, symptoms, depression, and sometimes dissociation. And we also see more of an economic burden. Many times the reason that women say, I can't possibly leave, I have no resources. And so we find if we can provide some of those resources for women, they are more likely to be able to leave the abusive relationship. Um, and so um, all of these go together in a perfect storm and make that trauma trail. One of the things we oftentimes don't recognize is what women say, he chokes me, and somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of abused women, especially in dangerous situations, sometimes have been choked by their partner. And if you ask them, did he strangle you, because it's actually a non-fatal strangulation, they will say no, because they don't think of it in that term. That sort of strangul strangulation is horror movies, it's ligatures, it's things like that. But does he ever put his hands around your neck and squeeze? Does he ever hold your, your neck against the wall until you slump to the floor, actually unconscious, but completely subdued? They'll say, oh yeah, yes, he does that. And he does that multiple times. And one of the things we have found that there's an increased risk of death within 24 to 48 hours, even if they live through it, because of stroke or choking on their own vomitus. We also see long-term central nervous system symptoms. We see that effect on the brain, not only from the trauma of the abuse, but also in terms of if you are slumped to the floor unconscious, you have lack of oxygen or anoxia to the brain, which causes memory loss. And it's actually probably a sign of traumatic brain injury that we're very aware of in terms of our returning veterans and our athletes. But when a woman comes to the emergency department with, for instance, a broken jaw, do we think, huh, I know what happens to boxers over time. There is oftentimes brain damage. I know what happens to shaken babies. You know, this is very hard on the brain. But an adult woman, do we do those traumatic brain injury workups? Do we do post-concussive workups with that kind of thing? Do we even look for strangulation, which we can see the signs of if we know how to look? So that's one of the things we're training our nurses to start looking for these kinds of issues and be able to identify it, but also having first responders ask about this. And very importantly, in adjusted odds ratios, look, we find that a non-fatal strangulation attempt increases the odds by almost seven for a later attempted homicide near lethal domestic violence incident, and increases the odds by seven and a half for a woman to be killed by her partner if he has strangled her before. Um, one of the, the sort of ironic stories is I'm on the Baltimore F Domestic Violence Fatality Review, and we looked at a case 
where a man had called the police and he said, you have to come. Somebody has broken into my house and strangled my wife to death. And so the police come. The woman is on the living room floor. Um, the, he says, I was upstairs sleeping and I heard a noise and I came down and the door had been broken open and here she is dead on the floor. So they did their good, you know, forensic CS, <laughs> uh, CSI investigation. And we have the transcripts of when they brought him downtown later to question him about this. And they point in their questioning, they had him retell the story. And then they asked, they pointed out to him that there were signs of a body having been dragged from the bed upstairs in the bedroom down the steps to the living room. Um, and they also pointed out to him that this break-in was not very credible in terms of physical evidence. And so finally he said, and I quote, he said, okay, okay, I did it. But you have to understand, I didn't mean to kill her. I've done this a bunch of times before, and she never died. So he had done this strangulation episodes a bunch of times before, and eventually that night she actually died from it. It only takes a few more minutes of pressure for someone to die. And yet we don't take this into account very well in the healthcare system. So we see in population-based data, women who have had intimate partner violence have more high cholesterol that link with cardiovascular disease, more disability, activity limitations, so lack of exercise may be in there somewhere, more arthritis, more heart attacks, more heart disease, more symptoms of stroke, and that may be related to these strangulation events, more smoking, twice as much smoking, and more risk factors for HIV. We also find men who say that they have been abused by a partner have also problems, arthritis, asthma, activity limitations, also stroke, risk factors for HIV, but this is cross-sectional data. So we don't know which came first, the violence event or what happened afterwards. We also find men having more heavier binge drinking after being victimized. Around with forced sex, we have this issue of more risk for HIV AIDS. We find that that's true around the world as well as in the USA. Uh, when we look at Africa, for instance, women are dying the most of HIV globally. And women in Africa have the highest mortality rates. And most of those women contracted HIV by heterosexual sex from their husband. And if you know the ABCs of HIV prevention, abstinence, well, you're not going to be abstinent if you're married. OK, be faithful. OK, she's, she's being faithful. He's not. She doesn't know about the partners that he has. C, use a condom. But if you have B, if you're being faithful, you don't need to use a condom. Besides, she might be afraid to ask him to use a condom. But that's how most women in Africa contract HIV, from husbands who have other partners that they don't know about. So we have, um, even in this country, forced first sex. We have up to 21% of young women in this country saying, my first sexual experience was physically forced. And so we can teach to be abstinent all we want. But if we're not also talking to young women about the possibilities of their first sexual experience being forced, we are not going to prevent um, unwanted pregnancies or HIV. Um, as I mentioned, in terms of abuse during pregnancy, we see more unintended pregnancy, this reproductive coercion. We see many maternal health correlates and uh, problems to children, including more child abuse. Um, and the particularly abusive man that actually hits his wife, girlfriend during pregnancy is very likely to hit their children. And he's also a dangerous man. So the chronic pain pieces can last a lifetime. I've talked to many women who were abused 10 years ago by their partner. And they will say things like, well, one of the things that oftentimes happens, I'll say, actually, the abuse wasn't that bad. He used to slam me up against the kitchen cabinets every once in a while. How often is every once in a while? Uh, two or three times a week, maybe, sometimes, or maybe only two or three times a month. But you know, this went on for five years. 
and I have chronic neck and back pain. And you're like, no wonder. Um, and part of that is the trauma trails through the body, uh, the effects on physiology, and part of it is related to old injury that have never been treated um, uh, particularly well. Um, and so this is a you know, physiological kind of slide where we see the trauma, PTSD, HPA axis going way back to uh, uh, physiology 101, hypothalamus uh, pituitary adrenal axis, you know, those little um, glands in our brains that have everything to do with our immune function. And it can both be suppression of immune function and activation of the immune function. So we have these physiological things that are, again, a trauma trail through the body um, and health declines. Um, so when we look at the insufficient regulation of immune system, depression by itself is likely to result in immune system depression, which is increased susceptibility to infection, quicker progression of HIV to AIDS and AIDS-related complications. But the comorbidity of depression and PTSD is what we see most often in abused women, that they have both PTSD and depression. Yet we in the healthcare system, in the mental health care system, we recognize that depression. We treat her for depression. What's the usual treatment for depression nowadays? Again, medication, without ever recognizing that PTSD that's underlying that depression and needs its own interventions. And that immune system activation is associated with chronic pain. That's one of the things that happens in our bodies when our immune system is activated. So it may be partly old injury, but it, it's also related to our immune system dysfunction. Increased BMI, all those women that Vince found that couldn't lose weight. So this is one of the things that we find when our immune systems are activated, we have a tendency to gain weight and be unable to lose it. And increased transmission of HIV through the vaginal wall and cardiovascular disease. PTSD, as I mentioned, um, is sometimes um, not recognized in abused women uh, because we ask them, have you ever been traumatized? Or have you ever been, um, what is your worst trauma in your life? And we don't ask them specifically about domestic violence. We list things like physical assault. Abused women very seldom talk about their boyfriend or their husband physically assaulting them. Uh, you know, that's terminology we use for stranger assault. So they may not ever check off any of these traumatized events, or they may see that the worst trauma that ever happened to me is when I was a child and my sister died, which is a trauma, but it's not a trauma that's likely to be engendering PTSD. And then part of the diagnosis is you have to have intrusive memories of the trauma event. So they have to dream about or think about the last time he hit her in order to qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD. Yet she is having all kinds of intrusive symptoms. She says, I wake up at night, I'm just scared to death, I don't know what it's about, I had a scary dream but I don't know what it's about. And again, she's sleeping next to him in a lot of those cases. Um, and she'll say, I walk into the kitchen and I'm all of a sudden, I have this panicky, scared feeling for no good reason. It's because many of those abusive events happen in the kitchen, and that is triggering her, but she won't qualify for PTSD in the, the uh, classic kind of diagnostic um, criteria. So oftentimes it's not treated um, correctly. Um, so to strategize addressing these health problems from a trauma framework, we're looking at both physical and mental health problems. Uh, we use both targeted as well as universal strategies for prevention. So we work on healing those who have been traumatized as children or are being traumatized now, as well as uh, working on the cognitive things. Um, and so this is an important issue. Things like arts-based uh, strategies uh, for victims and their families so they can process that trauma as well as get some sort of uh, relief for um, some of the ongoing abuse.
So in the uh, Affordable Health Care Act, we now have as part of our Well Woman Visit. How many women in here have been on their Well Woman Visit? It's now covered. All right, a few of you. Were you asked about domestic violence? Good. <laughs> It's a covered service now, and it's supposed to routinely be in primary care um, when you go for this preventive health care visit. Uh, one of the ironies is it's only for women 18 to 55, as if you know the abusive partner magically goes away at 55. Um, so we're, we're not always asking it um, all over. But all of this is happening. Um, and th when we make the case for this routine screening, it's because we have tremendous prevalence of domestic violence. If we have somewhere around a third of women saying sometime in my lifetime I have been abused, even by the, the uh, most population-based survey. And women are not going to disclose abuse unless they're asked. You better believe you're not going to say, oh, and by the way, he hits me. Um, when people are asking about um, your uh, sexual practices. Um, and routine screening is desired by the majority of women. One of the things our, my uh, medical colleagues say, well, our first responsibility is to do no harm. And what if by asking we re-traumatize women? There's no evidence of that. In fact, there's been clinical trials that have shown that there's no um, traumatic effects from being asked about domestic violence. Uh, one of the things I oftentimes tell my students is women will decide who and when to disclose to. And if they think you're not a very credible, trustworthy kind of a provider, why would they tell you they're being abused? But it gives them an opportunity to say, yes, this is happening to me. And yes, I would like some sort of services for it. And then we can give her choices. And importantly for the medical community is to say, we will misdiagnose or incompletely diagnose and inadequately treat if we fail to identify current or past IPV with the health problems that she is um, presenting with. We know how to assess. Uh, interestingly, we find that using it computerized oftentimes works the best, that women are more likely to tell a computer than a real live person um, that they're being abused, probably because it takes away the issue of asking badly. One of the things we oftentimes find is that providers, um, I just had one of my students go in uh, for a concussion workup. Um, she uh, had a fall and had a uh, potential concussion, so she went to my emergency department and, you know, where they're supposed to know better, and the nurse said, nobody hit you, did they? <laughs> Never made eye contact, <laughs> you know, did the, you know, nobody did that, right? So I could check this off, no. Um, and so um, my student bravely called her on it. She said, aren't you even going to look at me when you ask that question? <laughs> um, so um, this is one of the things that, that we're um, starting to do in a computerized way. And some places like my own hospital did this, are you safe at home question, because they wanted one gender neutral question that wouldn't offend anybody, that would be easy to ask. So everybody thinks they're asking about safe uh, um, smoke alarms. Are you safe at home? Oh yeah, my smoke alarm's working. Uh, so <laughs> it doesn't work very well. And, but there are one question things that we can put into all healthcare histories um, and then ask specifically about things like um, uh, forced sex. So it matters how you introduce the screen. It matters that you say something like, because domestic violence happens to so many women, if you're going to do it out loud, that you introduce it with something like that. Or because domestic violence results in so many health problems for women, we're asking all women these questions. So it doesn't come out of the blue from somewhere. Um, and we, we find that if we put things in the environment, if we put posters up, that it, it signals to women, oh, we, we know about this issue and we care about this issue. And we might just ask you about this issue. Um, so that, that helps in terms of, of um, giving them a, a, a heads up that this is going to happen. And it also helps if providers know there's in-house backup. Um, culture matters. Hispanic women in LA, they're afraid somebody's going to get deported if they say yes to a query about domestic violence. Um, that even if their citizenship uh, is impeccable, that he has threatened them that if they tell anybody he's going to get their sister deported. And they also know that if he's convicted of domestic violence, if it goes to a criminal matter, 
that he may well get deported. And she wants the violence to stop, but she doesn't necessarily want him to have to leave the country. Um, so moving forward, we need to identify the best brief counseling, learn how to do really careful referrals, give women choices, incorporate domestic violence prevention and interventions into home visitation programs. Uh, it depends on where we're doing it, how we're gonna do it. Um, and we need to always remember that many women are committed to that relationship. And again, whether they're Hispanic or otherwise, that they want him to stop hitting. They don't necessarily want their family situation to end. And they're very concerned about their children. So of course there's an app for that. Um, and one of the things that we found, there's the 3R app that helps you ask in healthcare settings. There's an app for the danger assessment to determine uh, which situations are the most violent. Um, these are from, uh, if you remember that case of the uh, uh, lacrosse player who was killed in the University of Virginia uh, by her boyfriend, Yardley Love. It's her mother that paid for these apps. There's also an iPlan app, which is particularly meant for young women 26, I mean 16 to 26, so university-aged women, um, that helps walk them through a safety planning strategy um, on an app. And their friends can do it too, so you can do it about your own relationship that takes into account what you wanna do with this relationship as well as how dangerous it is and walks you through some options. Um, and there's a, a dating violence um, hotline that also has a texting um, response. So they can text. And there's other adolescents at the other end of the, the hotline. So from a trauma framework that investigates both physical and mental health problems, helps women understand some of the complexities of their health problems. Wow, so I'm not crazy. It's just that I've experienced so much and it has affected my body, not just my head. Um, investigating old injuries, looking at stress elevation, uh, alleviation interventions to help with that healing, um, and culturally based strategies for traumatized kids and families. Uh, the decision aid is that what that My Plan app is, is based on, um, the trauma informed care. Um, needs to be for all people who have been traumatized, but what gender has to do with it is women who are experiencing current domestic violence relationships need particular strategies to both keep them safe or get them safe in their own choice framework and deal with their health problems. Um, and uh, this PowerPoint, by the way, I can leave with people and, and they can put it on the, the website if you want to look at more, because I needless to ha say have much more stuff um, than anybody wants to listen to tonight. But SAMHSA has a whole website on trauma-informed care. And again, as I mentioned, women who are abused, uh, that we need to deal with their injuries, old injuries, as well as current injuries. Um, the, the cultural issues that impinge on it, as well as the childhood trauma that impinge on it. Um, we, they may well have some mental health problems that need to be dealt with in a healing framework, not a you're crazy framework. Uh, you need therapy framework, uh, but you, uh, it looks like it might be helpful to you to have some work to, to work on healing this trauma that you've experienced. It's a much more, um, you know, informed framework than saying you need to see the psychiatrist next. Uh, the physiological mechanisms we have to understand um, and so that we're doing safety planning, um, getting them to domestic violence advocacy organizations if we can or otherwise doing brief safety planning in the healthcare system. Uh, so they have an increased sense of safety, an increased sense of efficacy, efficacy which also helps to decrease stress, as well as the trauma-informed healing strategies. And we'll see improved physical and mental health eventually. It may not happen right away. Um, so a sanctions and sanctuary framework is that the healthcare system can be a sanctuary for women. 
but also we need to think about women's status and their rights. Uh, we need to think about, especially when we look globally, the other forms of gender-based violence um, that also lead to trauma. And we need to remember that when women's rights and resources increase, this may lead to periods of increased femicide. Uh, so women need sanctuary, but we also need to address women's rights and resources to make it a more equal playing field and to make women more able to escape abusive relationships. So there's that combination of sanctions, our laws, um, the resources that we have, and then the sanctuary, a place for abused women to find healing and to find safety. Um, so there's places to help. Futures Without Violence has a lot of good stuff. Um, there's also, in Futures Without Violence, some strategies to, to look, work with our communities. This is called Coaching Boys into Men, where we have the coaches in our communities um, teach lessons of how to not to be violent, along with lessons of how to kick the ball, how to hit the ball. This will be very healthy um, for them growing up, but again, we also need to do the trauma strategies. So one of the moms that I interviewed in the femicide study told me that I always have to say, please don't let her death be for nothing. Please get her story told. And I promised her and I will. And another abused woman talking about, I want to see my daughter grow. I want her to be a little girl. I don't want to keep the cycle going. So women know that. I want her to see good things while she grows up and not abuse. Um, and we have some global work being done on all of this. Um, there's Together for Girls, which is a survey of child abuse globally. Um, we also have Pigs for Peace in um, uh, that, um, Congo, which has its own website. So there's a lot of strategies being done around the world where women are banding together to provide each other sanctuary, as well as change the norms, change the sanctions, so it's not OK to hit a woman globally. Thank you. Should we take a few questions right now? And So I noticed you didn't talk a lot about the role of the, um, the employer in the workplace. And um, so a couple years ago, I was responsible for um, uh, the health in a corporation. And it was a company of about 35,000, 75% of them were female. And uh, violence comes to the workplace. So one of the things that we found which was really helpful was having a coordinated approach where mm -hmm we would have posters and very similar to what you were talking about, but the idea was that if you had someone who worked for you or someone who sat next to you or someone that you had lunch with who appeared like they were in a tough spot, you didn't need to get uh, in their space, but you needed to express concern. And if you were really concerned, because we did have situations where women unfortunately did die in work units and there was tremendous guilt um, where people knew that it was going on and they didn't know where to go. So we work with uh, security and our HR people and, and developed an approach that would be respectful, but the bottom line was it allowed women to keep their jobs because that was a stabilizing influence for oh, them. Oh, and, and gave them the resources to be able right, to help and had, do something right. about and so And the feedback was so gratifying, yeah, so very, right. very similar. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. You know, if I'd have had my three hours worth, I certainly would have gone there, I promise you, because that is something I care a lot about. Um, and that workplace is incredibly important. Wherever you see someone that you think might be abused, uh, say something. Uh, I remember I had a black eye many years ago, a really great shiner, I had actually fallen and. And I had a woman come up to me in the grocery store. She said, are you okay? Are things okay at home? I thought, brilliant. I thanked her. I said, what a great way to put it. 
And how wonderful that you were able to come up to me and say that. As a matter of fact, yes, but I will pass that on. That's a great way to say, you know, uh, without getting in somebody's space or getting in somebody's business. But definitely for coworkers, for friends, um, that's why the My Plan app has that, you know, you can do it um, by yourself for a friend. You can put your friend's situation in there. And then it urges you to get the friend and have her go through it with you. Um, and so um, that's the kind of um, strategies in terms of, of enlisting support systems. And if you think about it in terms of stress, that's a stress alleviation kind of a strategy, is to do some of those kinds of things with a friend. But the, there's workplace materials. There's a number of different websites. Uh, Futures Without Violence um, has workplace um, strategies on that website as well as other websites. There's a lot of employers who have taken this on, and it's fabulous. Um, we also need to do it in our occupational health um, and our, um, uh, our employee assistance programs where we're also doing the kind of routine asking about partner violence um, as well as workplace violence, which is another issue for people. I just read some stats actually that the um, number two cause of women being killed on the workplace after a stranger robbery kind of, not to, categorize, you know, 7-Eleven sort of, or, or a gas station sort of a robbery uh, when a female employee is killed. Second leading cause is partner homicides of um, the, the workplace um, deaths. So a very important part of the picture for employees and uh, something that we all need to think about. So thanks for bringing that up. Hi, um, I'm interested in, um family level interventions for people who experience domestic violence. Um, I'm wondering if you've had any experience working with, you know, I've, I've noticed a lot that our interventions tend to be about the woman or it's mm -hmm. about working with the children individually, but it doesn't really help families repair after um, right. violence. Which would be incredibly important. There's a few uh, family strategies um, that have been developed, and there's a few programs that work with families. I mean, one of the, the best places is through um, domestic violence shelter and advocacy organizations. They always have programs for children, um, and there's very much a, at least a mom and kids approach. Uh, extended families, though, are very important, too. And we find for abused women, sometimes extended families are not very supportive. They're all saying, oh, you know, stick with it. This is what men do. You know, some of their, so, so we have to be careful in terms of, you know, how we help women access family members who are supportive. Uh, but certainly uh, for the children affected by violence, it would make really good sense if we had some family strategies. Um, and I, I'm sure there's individual therapists that, that do that and do that well but how we get access um, for most people to those kinds of, of strategies is oftentimes an issue. Thank you for your lecture and for the really important work you're doing, Dr. Campbell. Um, I was wondering why you seem to exclude data regarding um, trauma and violence related to war. I happen to be a a person who was affected by that as, as a young child. Mm -hmm. And my very first memory was a recurring nightmare of being pursued by soldiers and being unable to physically run away. And so and that set the stage for future yeah. things. And, yeah, what and a, that's minor yeah. compared to all the what real incredible rapes that trauma. happened, of course. And when you look globally, I mean, that is certainly an issue now. And again, if I could have done the three-hour version, it would have been there, because that's one, one of the things I'm, I'm working on now is um, the violence in uh, conflict areas um, and in the violence in many of the refugee camps uh, settings after conflict. But certainly we have, uh, that's one of the trauma trails. I mean, talk about an adverse childhood event. Um, <laughs> that would have to be off the map in terms of counting. Uh, so, um, you know, we're fortunate in this country uh, we have sent a lot of our young men to combat, and they are coming back uh, with um, high degrees of trauma, many of them. 
which is something that we, um, we see the results of in some of these um, mass shootings on bases, et cetera. Uh, but around the world, when we look at the number of children, for instance, that are being affected by just um, the war in Syria, for instance, I mean, it's, you know, it's just incredible amounts of children that are being traumatized. And when you look at those parts of the world, if we went into it deeply, and there are some people that look at that in terms of children that are traumatized by wartime settings, and then that also perpetuates the cycle that those countries continue to be, um, have issues around warfare, et cetera. Um, so part of it is, um, you know, I'm, I'm very um, impressed with the work that they've done in Rwanda for instance, that has been very much around healing and social justice rather than a criminal justice kind of approach um, in order to heal those communities. And, and I know there's still tensions there, but you know, and they're now teaching the children uh, what happened then. And I was just hearing you report this morning of an older child that remembered um, talking to younger children um, about um, you know what that experience was like and that trauma, so definitely um, that's another source of trauma and one that we have to be very concerned about globally is how many of our children are being affected um, by wartime kinds of trauma. Yes, no, go ahead. You were mentioning Rwanda, and I was wondering if because it's women who survived and many more men, I guess, were killed, that yeah. and therefore women were in charge of perhaps bringing about the, the healing um, formats. And Gender so matters, yeah, does it I'm not? Wondering. Yeah, interesting. I don't, I've never heard an analysis like that, but that's very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And women were certainly traumatized by it, uh, were raped in horrific numbers, et cetera, but not as many women dying. Yes. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. I wonder um, if you've looked at all at efficacy of uh, bystander intervention programs. I'm most familiar with the Green Dot program, yeah. which we implement on my campus. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but in terms they, of what we were talking about before, in terms of normalizing, just asking somebody, are you okay? Or normalizing or creating a culture where the bystander right. has matters, not yeah. only where we don't have a tolerance of, of, of intimate personal violence, but also that more people want to intervene and have the skills to intervene. Yes, and they've, they've definitely, there's some really good work on bystander interventions, particularly for um, peer violence, um, not as much as the, of the partner violence per se, but that has been started to be um, uh, put in some college campuses for all kinds of violence, so uh, teaching other um, students to uh, step in, to say something, to um, and to say to perpetrators, no, that's not okay, to move the needle on sanctions, to say, you know, oh, that's not okay in this, we don't do that on this campus, we, you know, nah. Um, and many people say that um, in your, the Yardley Love um, case, um, that one of uh, Charles's friends actually saw him choking her um, and did step in and said, okay, that's enough, you two, let's, and walked her home, but never said, ooh, that's, that's dangerous, that's scary, that's, we need somebody else to step in here, this is not okay. And he also sent a bunch of emails to her that said things like, I should have killed you when I had the chance, talking about the last time they had an a, a altercation. Um, and you should have died that night. Um, and many repetitive emails like that. And all of her friends said, oh, Yardley, yuck, it's a good thing you're breaking up with him. Nobody said, ooh, that is really scary. That is, so we also need to teach bystanders to recognize when it really gets dangerous. And we also need to help bystanders realize when somebody really needs some of these healing strategies as well as a, no, this isn't okay here, you know, and help them get there as well as, as um, uh, you know, making it clear it's not okay or reaching out to somebody. But thank you very much for bringing that up.
It's a really good strategy. It's been found to be useful with other forms of violence. It has not yet been tested for partner violence, but I think it's got lots of promise.